All right, we ready to get this shindig on the road? I'm as ready as I'll ever be right now. Mm. That doesn't sound very enthusiastic, Martin. Listen, I'm just going to take another hit. Watermelon, habanero, lemonade. <laughs> what is that? I don't know what it means. <laughs> Watermelon, habanero, lemonade. You know, I was going to start this episode by talking, you hit talking this to ranch? you. Ooh, I do want to hit this ranch. I was going to start this episode out by talking to you about my cup full of fish. Oh, yeah, that's As it stuff. smells like. Cup of fish. Cup O cup apostrophe fish. fish. Cup you fish. know, I understand that Lapsang Suchong tea is very old, and it's a very traditional tea, and I'm sure there are many people who can trace their heritage back generations. <laughs> through the tea leaves. Through, through the tea leaves or through people who harvested these tea leaves, but I got a branding tip for the Lapsang Suchong tea farmers. Why not just call your tea... Cup o fish, yeah, cup o fish. Bam, it smells exactly like smoked salmon. It does, like in a in a nice way. It's kind of nice. My friend Chase told me that this tea is like a pro tea, like most new tea drinkers oh, are not, not going to like it. It's not, yeah, it's not for filthy casuals who play Candy Crush on their iPad well, and get their PSLs or whatever. It makes it's sense. hardcore. I mean, a casual is not going to drink a smoked salmon. That doesn't That's sound true. very casual to me. But I got to say, the first time I tried it, I was like, this is actually really good. And I love the smell of smoked salmon. And the taste is actually very good. I don't drink it straight, though. I, dr I do put, like, cream in it. Ooh. So, Ooh. Which means it's now poison to uh, you. <laughs> why? Because it's good that way, dude. Fair enough. It is good. But, yeah, I just got back from Colorado. I spent basically the entire week uh, both skiing, which is awesome, and helping my friend Matt film a coffee course. And because we were filming a coffee course, there was lots of excess coffee that had to be drank, which I'm not complaining about, but it is nice to come home, switch gears a little bit, and drink some tea. Yeah. Uh, I had been out of tea for like two weeks, and I kept forgetting to go to the tea shop. So I went there yesterday, and I am stocked now. Got spiced tea, got cup of fish. As I'm going to call it now, got some uh, lemon hibiscus tea and I got some cherry blossom green tea. So, yeah, oh. I'm feeling pretty zen over here. Cool. I don't know about you. Cool. Well, I'm feeling like my throat's burning from this habanero <laughs> lemonade. <laughs> but it tastes need, so good. I need to try it at some point because, yes, I'm, so, so I'm trying to batch. imagine what like the sweetness of lemonade the, the front, and like the spice of a habanero pepper taste would is, taste like. It's exactly like you were just drinking watermelon lemonade. So delicious. But then when you swallow it. Suddenly you're like, oh God, there's habanero in there. It's completely unnoticeable until you've swallowed it and it starts to burn the back of your throat. Huh. It's a, I don't know, I'm still drinking it. You know, when I turned 20, I believe, or maybe 21, it might have been my 20, mm, no, never mind, it was my 22nd back in birthday. My day. Back in my day. Yeah. When I turned 22, I was in Japan with my friend Ryan and... He surprised me with a birthday party at this restaurant that was like half a haunted house and half of a restaurant. And my cake was delivered by this ridiculously creepy clown. It was like that kind of thing. Oh, a but nightmare. It was, it was fun. It was like, yeah, my birthday was a nightmare. Cool. But they had all these weird, creepy themed drinks you could buy. And I bought this vodka drink that had dried chili peppers in it. And I forget the name. Oh, it was, it was called Freddy Nails. Like the chili peppers were supposed to be like... Freddy's Nails oh, from the movie I gotcha. Friday the 13th or whatever. Actually, oh no, Nightmare on Elm Street. That's what yeah. Freddy's from. Yeah, what are you doing? I don't know my classic horror movies. I, I get spooked with those things. But it was like that. It was like sweet. But then as it went down, the spice just kicked you in the face and then you wanted to drink something more. But of course, all you have in front of you is the same drink. Yeah. So, I it's don't know. A trap. It was a trap. It was a very good way to get me to buy another drink that was not that one. <laughs> yeah. Anywho, uh, we got some questions today, and you know what, Martin? I don't know what. I'm I'm tired of trying to make up fake sources for these questions. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we're do we've been doing it for so long, like, I don't know, 10, 20 episodes at this point? I don't Probably know. Probably not 20. Probably not 20. But we're but... running out of lame superhero yeah, lists, there, and yeah. I, was like, I was like, hmm, they could come from, like, Winston Churchill and, like, Gandhi uh, and a dog, but, uh... That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of effort. We'll just pull back the curtain. And eventually, all the bad heroes eventually they have like the same stupid powers. Because they do. They're bad because they're either ridiculous or unoriginal. So. They don't have the same powers. I mean, like the the ability to turn anything into a gun is quite different than being made of ice cream. 
Yeah, but like the and your name being that I we scream. can have around them is going to get it's going to become less and sure. less and less as they keep being. There kind is of, that's the ca- same kind of dumb. Yeah, as this kind of dumb. There's a diminishing return on investment. There is, yeah, or what is, is it? The law of diminishing now. returns. Yeah, this is a business podcast. We're going to tell you how you can increase your revenue and 10x your conversion rate through your sales funny, f- funny funnel by <laughs> implementing our brand new conversion tracking software. Ooh, sell your soul. Matic. Yeah, con- ooh, let's use that. Let's convert o matic name. We're going to buy that right now. I wonder if there's like o matic, like dot o matic. Dot illmatic. Dot illmatic. Oh, I was telling you yesterday, and now that I'm going to say on the podcast, they will be gone instantly. But, uh, I think like I answered a question from you or something from you in Slack yesterday with like dope.limo because they usually just do dope.com. Yeah. And then I figured out that dope.limo is available. Yeah, like limo is a real thing. Yeah. Dot limo is a real thing. Well, I knew that because um, the Why? Reply All podcast, actually, like their website is replyall.limo. I what think is, they just did it to be quirky even? and fun. But uh, I, I found out that they're like, dope.reviews is available uh dope.products is available like i don't know if i had some time <laughs> I got and some dope products. Whoever, you know if you're listening to this take this idea i would make some sort of like cool think geeky or like whatever kind of theme website where just i just post a dope.products and then like bam amazon affiliates right there yeah plenty of people done this uh i think there's one that's like take my money.com or something like that i don't know what it was but it was, it was basically just a bunch of weird and fun products like Hulk hands and a Game of Thrones mug or something. Uh, and it was just like a never ending wall of them. And of course, they were all affiliate links to Amazon. So Naturally. that person's probably just rolling in the dough. But anyway, we are going to uh, ditch the lame superhero and or fake question sources bit for now. Because <laughs> I don't know when you're sitting there think trying to think of like sources and just nothing's coming to mind, you know. The joke is dead. Yep. And new jokes must be invented. What are you going to do? Or we need time to innovate. It's true, right? You know, more cups of fish must be drank. So these questions, as you probably well knew before I even told you, what? actually, spoiler for the most part, come from our community over on Reddit. And you can find that at collegeinfogeek.com slash community. That'll magically port you over there through the power of redirection. And uh, basically, that is our community where it's like the main place where questions can be asked that we take for the podcast, but also that other people can answer as well. So it's a good place if you have a question about college, about learning, about productivity or even careers or whatever it may be, you can post it there, get answers from other ambitious students like yourself, and also possibly get them answered on this podcast. But we also take questions from email um, I'm not always good at email at answering questions personally via email, but I do save them all. So you can email if you want, uh, or twit, twit, twit. Yep. Twit.com. You're out don't of touch. Go to, don't go to twit.com. You're out of touch. Old Actually, man. I think twit.com is just this week in tech, which is like a tech podcast that's been oh, running for 15 years. I used to listen to it back when I would walk through the cornfields and my summer job as a teenager. But you can't go to twit.com to get questions to us. So Twitter is actually where you want to go. You can tweet us questions. My Twitter handle is Tom Frankly. So boom. Let's get into these questions. We don't have sources. Martin just grabs them, throws them into a sauna, and we've got them to answer. The first question this week is, how do you choose a city or place to start your career? Ooh. Which I thought was a very interesting and timely question. Because as you probably know, as a listener of this podcast, unless you're brand new, uh, Martin and I are moving to Denver. Oh, yeah. In basically two months as we record this. I don't know when this is coming out, but two months as of today or something like that. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. So I think that our experience is going to be a little different than what a lot of people do. It may be the opposite because... What what I think most of us did is we chose the city first and then we were kind of like, at least, well, not me, but you guys were kind of like artificially constrained as to where you could look for jobs because you had chosen the city first. Yeah. And I think that, and maybe this is a simple answer, a lot of students, um, they go out and they look for a job anywhere and they end up moving to that city because they find a good job. Now, there's a lot of different aspects that go into this. 
And one thing I know is that depending on the university you go to, there's going to be more connections. There's going to be more representation, like career fairs from semi-local companies. For instance, we went to Iowa State University. When you go to Iowa State University's career fair, you're going to be meeting with people from like Union Pacific, which is the train company, Principal Financial, Aetna, the insurance company, Wells Fargo, and then like a bunch of Minneapolis companies like Boston Scientific, uh, Thomson Reuters. But basically, it's all, it's all regional. So for the most part, people who graduate from Iowa State University, who I talk to at least, usually end up at least right out of school either staying in the Ames slash Des Moines area, or they end up going up to Minneapolis or going down to Kansas City, going to Chicago, uh, going over to Omaha, those kind of like regional cities. So just keep in mind, like the companies and the employment opportunities you're going to find the most of are going to be regional for the most part, which just makes sense because yeah. the recruiters don't have to travel incredibly far distances and they probably have partnerships with the university to maybe like preferentially hire some people that happens sometimes. So, I mean, I guess you can, you can consider your job as like a big determining factor. I wanted to put that up front because now I want to give a caveat. When I was in college, I met a uncomfortably large number of people who, when I would ask them like, what is your goal? What is your plan for your life right now? Where do you see yourself in five years? Those kind of questions. They would just say, I want to get a good job or I want to make a lot of money when I graduate. And then, you know, nothing beyond that. And they didn't think about the other aspects of their lives. So uh, for an example, when we lived back in the Ames apartment, I think you were finishing college up, I was done. Our friend Joel would always be like, hey, let's go to the pool in the summer. So we went to the pool. And one, one day I met this dude who was just visiting some friends at Ames. And he told me, uh, yeah, I graduated last year. I got an awesome job. It's paying me like 70K a year, but I had to move out to this little tiny town in the middle of nowhere in Iowa. And I don't know anybody there. Everyone who lives there is old. There's nobody my age and I'm super bored. And to me, that was like, yeah, to me, that was like the best example of this idea that you have to look at your entire life holistically when you're forming your goals for what you want to do. You obviously can't do everything right away. Like if you're like, I want to live in a helicopter, I actually want to live in a pool that's hang, hung from a helicopter in the middle of the sky at all times and work from my cell phone while I'm in that pool. Like that's not going to work that at least cool, right though. out of college. It'd be, yeah. I mean the floating helicopter house idea. I mean, po- helicopter pool house in every way. It sounds possible, awesome. But... You're going to need like the oil expenditures of a small country to keep that thing up, but it's fine if you do it in, I don't know, 20 years or something, but right out of college, it's not going to work. But don't go to the other opposite end of the spectrum where you're just feeling like all I want is a job. I'm not even going to think about any of the other aspects of my life outside of work because I'm just so scared about even getting a job. Like, no, think about where you might want to live, what kind of area you might want to live in. You know, you're not going to get everything you want, but you do need to think about those things. Yeah, because I think that you got your location, you've got the people, Mm -hmm. you've got the job itself and then any extracurriculars and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That determine what you can do. One of the reasons I wanted to go to Denver was because there are a few certifications that I can take in Denver that I can't take in this area. Mm-hmm. So that's a factor. Yeah, absolutely. And we all ended up around here because we were still finishing up uh, with friends at the time. Yeah, I think the reason we all stayed here, I graduated college and I graduated, basically went full time on College Info Geek. And uh, I was like, well, I can work from wherever I want. So my value was staying near my friends and also staying in town while my girlfriend finished up college herself because she's two years younger than me. Had I not been able to take College Info Geek full time and had I not met Anna, it's likely that I would have gone up to Minneapolis Yeah, because there were more uh, web development job opportunities available. And at the time, before I was able to know that like this website will basically provide a full-time income, my plan was to go become a web developer because I had done my internship in corporate IT and I learned that I really don't like IT infrastructure work because it's very maintenance based. Uh, And so I thought like, okay, web development is more creative. It's more like I'm building something new. I could do that. So that was my plan. And then I had some friends who had already been planning on moving to Minneapolis. They had already gotten jobs. So I was like, all right, I won't have to ditch all my friends. I'll get a new experience. That sounds like a cool plan. Then College Info Geek 
became full time. And I was like, cool. All my best friends are still here in Ames. I'm going to stay here. And then we just kind of decided to stay here for a couple more years. So, I mean, you, you picked Denver partly for those certifications. Yeah. So that's like a big long-term learning goal for you. Yeah. And that gave me a choice of like several cities. Mm -hmm. And within that, I continued to pick Denver for just the area and the nature in the area, mountains and things that I hadn't been able to go to before. Yeah. Yes. That's a huge thing for me. I have always wanted to live somewhere where I either have access to an ocean or mountains. And it was like either or I love both. And uh, over the summer, I learned how to surf and I've been skiing for a couple of years. I absolutely love both. And the reason I ended up going with Denver was I think we actually looked at San Diego first and it was really expensive. So then I went and looked at Denver and Boulder area. Uh, I have a really good friend who lives in Boulder, but Boulder is also crazy expensive. So we ended up looking at Denver and Denver's not cheap, at least by Iowa standards, but it's more affordable than San Diego. So uh, we ended up doing that. That puts me close to mountains because I absolutely love skiing. I love hiking. There's just a lot more fun outdoor opportunities. I will be much more incentivized to exercise. And I am a person that does not like rain. Oh, yeah. Which like crosses off Portland and Seattle for my list. I love the nature in the Pacific Northwest. It's amazing. It's like the most lush, green, amazing thing I've ever seen. But it's so rainy that... You know, you can't really be outside all that much. And I love to be outside. So Denver's got 300 days of sunshine a year. I was like, cool. Yeah, Works so for me. Climate and daily lifestyle. Those are pretty important. Mm-hmm. You really got to determine what your top factor is. Do you care more about the job or more about one of these things and then base it off that? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess to wrap up, uh, your career prospects are going to be a big thing. So think about what your major is, what your skills are, what your talents are, and then start looking at potential career paths, there may not be one path for you. Like Martin was an MIS major, but you went and did web development. You could have done IT infrastructure work. You could have probably done project management. Yeah. Like depending on your major, you may have a skill set that can go in any number of different directions. So start thinking about different kinds of positions that you could look at and then weigh which one seems like the most interesting one to you, but also, but also like, mix that in with the factors of where do I want to live? What city would be kind of cool? Do I want to be close to family or do I want to really branch out, check out something new? Do I have friends I want to follow or stay, uh, you know, stick close by? There's just tons of different factors. And then just like, see what is the most realistic option that'll still challenge me, that I'll still be satisfied with and that I have employment prospects in. Yeah. And I think we'll probably do more stuff about moving to a new city soon because it's something that we're doing right now. Yeah. So it's definitely at my pre-conscious. I'm thinking about it. Yeah. So if, if you have questions about this topic, if you have questions about like, you know, what it takes to move to a new city or the financial aspect, whatever for a job in a different city. Yeah. You... We are all going through. Well, I'm not going through that, but I'm helping well, yeah. my girlfriend go but... through that. You're helping your girlfriend yeah. we, do we, that. We know of the topic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, if you have questions about that, you can put them in our community and we will tackle them on the show. But we're going to move into the second question here. And this is an interesting one. So the question at a base level is, would you advise taking five classes on the same day? But the details of the question, this person on the Reddit has basically two options. Either uh, take five classes in a row on Mondays, and that would would entail taking French normally, or they can take a intensive two-week French class that happens after the semester ends, which is three hours a day for 12 days. That sounds awesome to me. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I could definitely see it not being awesome to some people. It also depends on whether their long-term goals involve actually speaking French or just getting the credits. Yeah. See, I've never done like three hours a day of, of French or any language like that, but I do know that um, Benny Lewis from fluent3months.com, when he takes on an intensive language learning project, he will basically do that where for a period of a few weeks, he is studying the language all day, every day and breaking it up. So if you really want to gain some really quick proficiency in a language, that might be a good thing to do. And it reminds me of a university that I looked at. Now, I didn't consider going to it when I was in high school, but I I got a mailer from them and I thought that their, their model was interesting. So they were like an automotive university. Uh, They basically teach people how to become auto techs. 
but their setup is not to have you take, you know, three or four classes a day over a regular semester. Instead, you take one class intensively for two or three weeks, and then you move on to the next one. Yeah, so maybe you I take like that idea intense transmission repair for three weeks, and then you move on to, uh, you know, brake line repair for three weeks or something like that. And I think that's pretty cool because it allows you to just crazily immerse yourself into one subject for, for a little while. Yeah, we've been talking about deep work so much lately. That's mm -hmm. a perfect example of how to consecutively apply deep work to new topics rather than kind of learn all four of them. Yeah. And you know what? That's I think now cool. that I remember, I got a mailer from some computer science university that had a very similar approach to learning web development or programming or game development. It was all super intense short-term classes that came one after another. Yeah, I'd be really interested in seeing like a comparison between the outcome of yeah, I would too. the different programs like that. See, the one thing that pops up in my mind is if like if you're doing the whole class in two weeks and then there's no review later on, like you are losing some of that benefit of like spaced repetition and coming back to a skill. So I guess like you have to find some way to apply the skill later on in the future. Otherwise, Otherwise you're going to learn gonna a bunch go. and then it might just go. Yeah. But on the flip side, there is definitely a huge advantage to just concentrating your learning and spending a lot of time. So I don't know, like, I think it would be kind of cool to go for that two week intensive French class. It's only two weeks. So, you know, maybe give it a yeah. try. And I mean, if, if this particular person wants to speak French, then they can maintain that on their own afterward. Mm -hmm. They won't, they won't need to force it with a classroom environment. They'll just use it on something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but more to the general nature of this question, would you advise taking five classes on the same day? So this is something that I wrestled with as a college student because every semester I would have to choose my classes and choose the time at which the classes would happen. So some semesters I would try this out where I would shove all the classes under like the Monday, Wednesday, Friday time blocks. So like my Mondays, Wednesdays yeah. and Fridays would be just uber concentrated, terrible days of nothing but class. But then as a reward, the Tuesdays and Thursdays were kind of free. And uh, I would also do this with work. I would be like, all right, let's try this. Let's have like Monday, Wednesday, Friday be tons of work, tons of class. And then Tuesday, Thursdays are super free. Or try to do a more balanced schedule where every single day of the week has a lot of stuff. And I got to say, I think I liked the concentrated bit a little better. Yeah. Um, and when I took my inter or when I did my internship after my sophomore year, they gave me the option of doing flex time where I could basically be like, they were basically saying you could work 40 hours a week, but you can do it in like whatever configuration you want. So I did four 10 hour days and then gave myself a three day weekend every week. And that was awesome. Yeah. So I don't know, like what I would advise is trying it out because at, at most it's one semester. And I think that, pretty much anybody can at least handle five classes on the same day. They may not like it, but you still have the same amount of hours in the week. And what five classes on one day does is it gives you longer stretches of work time where you're not in class to work on homework or to study or to do a part-time job or be involved in clubs. Like you have more unstructured time that you can control. And that was what I was all about in college. Like give me time I can control because I want that. I want freedom. So that's one angle. If you're the kind of person who doesn't do well without structure, though, you may actually be better off putting more of the classes on a more balanced, like all throughout the week kind of schedule. Yeah, otherwise, you might just completely blow off your free yeah. day that you just gained. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're work. waking up at 10, 10 a.m. on your Tuesday, Thursdays and just kind of lazing around being like, man, I'll do my work on Wednesday. Then you're going to have a horrible time with your homework when yeah. you're doing like five days worth of stuff mm -hmm. all at once. So some people are better with structure that is all throughout the week. And some people are better just shoving everything into one really, really crappy, ultra concentrated day. And then... <laughs> You look like you're dying. Bottom of the bottle. <laughs> Most it just habanero. Like full of habanero. <laughs> anyway, yeah, some people are better at just concentrating all of the obligations into one small period of time and then giving themselves a lot of time to work on their own things. It's up to you to figure out which one of those kind of people you are. So third question, got about five minutes to answer it. 
Ooh. Otherwise, I'm going over time. Ooh. Is what can I do to expand and empower an otherwise shallow resume for people with little to no experience? Which is a good question. So, number one, I have always been a proponent of part-time work, either on campus or in high school. Now, this isn't this does not work for everyone in every country, because I know like some other countries have incredibly time-consuming school schedules that the Americans don't have. Uh, some colleges don't allow you to work, but I always found that my resume was basically full all the time because I was always working in college. You had like four trillion jobs. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and in high school, I had a bunch of jobs in high school, you know? Um, but jobs aren't the only option out there. You can do extracurriculars. Almost forgot the word for a second. Yeah. So if there's like, for example, in my case, I did business council, which is like basically like we were the liaison between the faculty and staff of the college of business and then all the students. So we basically create events where they could all come together and network or we would do counseling where any business student could come in and talk to us about the like best classes to take or what they should do for their particular goals so that was cool and i volunteered to be the web design coordinator for that club so i had a leadership position and i was able to build something for my portfolio at the same time uh, i was in guitar club i was on the solar car racing team but i was just the web designer but, you know, I think if you can find opportunities to just get yourself involved, even volunteer opportunities, even things that happen over a weekend, you know, you could rack up five or 10 hours of volunteer experience. I was a sound tech at uh, one group when I was in college. Like there's just all kinds of things you can do that you don't really need a crazy resume to get into because either it's yeah. volunteer or it's experiential learning. They want you to learn. They don't care what your experience is up front. And then that stuff can help to bolster your resume, get you that initial professional position that then becomes the centerpiece of your resume going forward. Yeah. And outside of like volunteer work and extracurricular activities on several versions of my resume, maybe the last one that I used, actually, I have several sections that aren't related to that stuff. So like a current project section, oh, the yeah. website that I was working on, the side projects I was doing, I had a language skills section, mm -hmm. I had a teamwork leadership section. So like you can kind of customize it if you have sections of your life that are interesting and worth showing off, yeah. but don't fit the traditional, this is a job kind of thing. You I might did, be able uh, to make it work. I did find something very interesting recently. So I'm working on a video. Let me see if I can find the script for it. Um, on improving your resume, actually. And I found a really interesting article. And let's see here. It is on Alan L Aline. I don't know how to say her name. Aline Learner's blog, which we can link to it here. But she mentioned that uh, she ran all this analysis on all the resumes that came into this company that she was working as a hiring manager for uh, a few years ago. And basically personal projects were not as effective as people often say they are on a resume. But the reason for this is because at least in her field, which is tech and the startup world, people would list personal projects in their resume. But then like a lot of times it would just be a GitHub profile where somebody had basically forked a bunch of projects, maybe made like one or two code changes and just kind of tried to make it oh. look like they were doing a lot that, of stuff on GitHub. That doesn't sound like it was a real personal project. It wasn't. But the problem is a lot of people do this. Oh, so many no. people do it that from the gatekeeper's perspective, a non-engineer who's just going through the resume, the prevalence of people doing that starts to bring down the overall effectiveness of having a personal project on your resume. So to combat that, you need to be able to show why your personal project is important, that taught you a lot, and is impressive. So don't don't just be like, personal project, I built, you know, wingdingsbot.io, and then you link to it, and it's literally just a GitHub profile. Like, if you're going to do a personal project on a resume, and you're going to use it, and you think it's going to be like something that really bolsters your resume, list it as work experience, and show like write out the accomplishments that you did. Mm -hmm. You know, changing, changing world we live in. Yeah. You got to adapt to people listing some nonsense. I get, you know, this is something that we're going to talk about more in the future. And we're probably going to work on like a course on this in the future at some point. But your resume is likely going to be viewed by different types of people, depending on where you apply, depending on the size of the company you apply at. 
And uh, certain people are, you know, are non-experts. They're non-domain experts. As a company gets bigger, they have to hire HR people, recruiters, hiring directors, all those kinds of people who don't necessarily know what an expert looks like in detail for whatever job you're going for. Like say you're, you know, Martin's a web developer. An HR person doesn't really know the difference between a great, like somebody who can write really clean, elegant code and somebody who writes bloated code so that Somebody is who slow. just animated every piece of their personal website. It all vibrates and jiggles when you yeah. mouse over it. That person doesn't have the relevant domain knowledge to know like what, which one of those is better. Now an engineer does. They can look at your code and be like, why aren't you using object oriented programming here, you dingus? Um, but the HR person doesn't know that. So they are going to kind of rely on like buzzwords. That's why you see job applications or job postings that say, you know, you need five years of experience and you need to know SQL and PHP and Joomla and Hadoop. And like they just grab every programming term they can find off of a Google search and shove it in there because what they're hoping for is they'll get somebody whose resume is peppered with buzzwords and peppered with experience and those are like easy signaling terms like oh yeah this person looks like they have a lot of experience let's put them in the short list i don't have to do too much work so that's why you have to start to think about like who's going to see my resume an expert or somebody who needs to see something shiny that stands out really really easily yeah you know and this might not be as relevant for somebody who has no experience and is just looking for an internship but it is something to think about going forward into the future. Yeah, if you're going to use a current project, make it legit, apparently. Yeah, and that's why uh, you can't rely on your resume too much either, to be 100% honest. Well, yeah, it's just a piece of paper. They're going to scan it for like three seconds. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't you get know, a good first impression, then it doesn't really matter what the details are. Your resume has to be bolstered by other elements, by your online presence, by your ability to network in person, build relationships, by all sorts of things. So we'll talk more about those in future episodes and videos and such, but just keep that in mind for the future if you're listening to this episode right now. So that about does it. I went two minutes over my timer. That's Sorry, Martin. It. That's fine. But uh, it's not I know too where bad. You sleep. You do know. That's creepy. And you're going to know when I move too. Damn it. Yeah. I will watch you forever. That's fine. Okay. If, if, I, if I wake up and you're just like clung to the outside of the building watching me. Yeah. I'm going to be concerned for your safety. But I'm going to be horrified. <laughs> and my safety as I well. Don't. <laughs> no, I don't really like heights and I'm not Spider-Man as much as I would love to be Tobey Maguire. Well, let's just go get bit, buy some spiders. That's I, that's going to hurt. We'll like pour some Drano on a spider. You're going to kill a spider and then <laughs> no, it'll be for no reason. It'll be just enough that it like mutates into a super spider. How much and is not that just enough? That spider's just going to die. I don't know, like an eyedropper worth or something? I'm going to poison this spider and then <laughs> I'm going to rub it on my wounds. Oh, wait, it has to be. Maybe I'll be Spider-Man. It has to be a radioactive spider. We're still talking be... about stupid heroes right now because now it's not even a real radioactive spider. We're just... It's just a drain, kind of Drano soaked spider guy who <laughs> got guy who ate a poison spider, man. What sort of superpowers do you think you would get if you got bit by a Drano soaked spider? Regret. Uh, <laughs> That's a power. <laughs> he has a lot of regret, shame. He might be poisoned depending on how much Drano there is. This is not a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Lamest superhero ever. We just stole the, the crown. From yeah. uh, from <laughs> yeah. what was a wild dog? He Something was the lamest like one, just the hockey guy with a gun. Oh yeah, and it's like his actual jersey. Yeah. Yep. Smart. Yeah, okay. Anyway, show notes for this episode are over at cigpodcast.com slash one forty five. There you will find links to any of the resources we mentioned in this episode or relevant articles and other things you should check out if you're curious. You will also find a link to rate and review this show on iTunes, which is one of the best ways that you can support this show and its continued growth into the future. By leaving a rating or review, or even subscribing in iTunes if you haven't done that, that really helps to bump the show up the rankings and shows it to more people. So definite thank you to you if you do that. Also, if you wanna find our favorite resources for learning more effectively, for becoming more productive, for even saving money and investing, you can find all that over at collegeinfogeek.com slash resources. So definitely check that out if you're looking for some new tools to improve your life. And that is all we got. So until next week's episode, stay cute.